Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Transformation Worship Center. We are glad to be in the presence of God. We feel God's presence here already. We don't have to start with the music or anything else. We know that his presence is here, is filled in this place in our hearts. So we just welcome his Holy Spirit right now. God we serve, he is so great. He is so mighty, he's so awesome. Come on, if, if you can breathe right now, you ought to give God praise. If you can move your limbs right now, you ought to give God praise. If you can eat and drink, if you can blink your eyes, you ought to give God praise because he is just too good. He is faithful to his children. I thank God for being a healer. You know, it sucks sometimes when when we when we wait until we can't do certain things to, to thank God for for function in our body. Um, my husband and I, I'm grateful that we recovered from COVID, but there were so many things we were unable to do. Move around, get up out of bed and take a few steps. And, and it wasn't until then when you're like, God, thank you that I have function in my legs. Thank you that it's not worse. And we found ourselves thanking God and acknowledging him so much more as a healer while we were sick. But it's because even in those moments, he's still faithful. So I'm just going to read scripture right now. Psalms 91. And I just pray that as I read this, that you may find peace in the word of God, in his promises. It says... Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Wow. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. This is God's promise to us. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever, wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you don't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen. All of these promises that God lists of things that he will do. Because he's just that good. He's just that faithful. So I just encourage you this morning, whatever, whatever hardship you may be going through right now, 
just know that there is victory in Jesus. There is victory in him. So continue to trust in him. Continue to walk with him. Believe in him. Let us take this time right now to just come to him in prayer. Our sovereign, almighty king. Great Jehovah, great God. Giver of life. Giver of health. Giver of strength. Of peace and hope. Of joy. Lord, we come to you this morning. Surrendering all to you putting all of our trust in our faith in you and you alone because you are worthy you have shown yourself strong time and time again so God we just thank you Lord we thank you that weapons are formed but they do not prosper Lord we thank you that you win every war that you wage we thank you that we are not alone. We thank you for being our refuge and our strength, our strong tower. Lord, you said the righteous can run to you and they are safe. So Lord, we run to you. We come to you right now. We kneel at your throne and we just surrender. Lord, carry us in your wings. Carry us with your hands, Lord God. Lord, I pray that in our, in our faith journey with you, we may continue. We may also be faithful to you. And not just wait to receive and to receive and to receive that. But that we may give our all to you. As we stand here in your presence today, I pray that we may pour out a praise. I pray that we may not have any left over, that we may give it all to you, that we may not wait until our circumstances are better or when we feel like worshiping a little more or when we are singing songs that we enjoy a little more. I pray that we may just give it all to you right now, right here, today, oh God. Because you deserve everything that we have to give. Lord, we long to see your face. We long to be with you in glory. Lord, our souls thirst for you. We long for you, oh God. So we pray that you will just meet us where we are. Lord, I pray. Thank you for each and every person who you have brought here safely. We thank you for traveling mercies. We pray that you may be with those who are still on their way. We pray that you may be with those who are, are tuning in live, Father God. Bless them in a mighty way. Bless them and allow them to feel your spirit wherever they may be. Father, I pray that you may forgive us of our trespasses, and I pray that you may just cleanse us white as snow. Give us clean hands and pure hearts so that we may worship you. Lord, thank you for satisfying our souls. And Father God, we just pray we pray right now that you may be glorified, that you may have your way in this worship experience today. Just have your way. Please help us to be obedient to your spirit, God. And I pray that we may worship through our hardship, worship through whatever it is that may be binding us, that may be holding us back from your glory. Lord, we love you and we thank you for being everything that we need, everything that we could ever want. You are, you are that and so much more. So as we take this time to lift up praises, may you receive them, oh God. 
Lord, we love you. We glorify your name. We honor you. May everything that we do, everything that we say, our behavior, our thoughts, may they honor you and glorify you, O oh God. We love you, O oh God, and we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So as we call our praise team up here. We just invite you to stand to your feet, to get excited as we praise his name. On our souls are thirsty for him. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek your face. Hallelujah. So come on, stand to your feet. God, as we sing, as we get excited in His presence. Come on, right here, say, Oh God, you are. feels feels uh, convenient right. we're gonna praise him right now Amen. even in the midst of trials even yes. in the midst of trouble because we know that we will see a victory mm. we yes. know that we will 
It's a guarantee because he has already won the victory for us. There's nothing we have to do but just trust in him and walk with him. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you.
don't deserve it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being such a great, a great Lord. So all we can do is return our praises to you, God. Lord, at this time, we pour out our praise. Pour out what it means to pour. You're not just taking a little drop of something and being cheap with it. You're pouring it out with no limits. Pouring out everything. Emptying out. That's what we're doing right now. Pouring out our praises to him and to him alone. Your breath in our 
what's already yours what already belongs to you jesus yeah. and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you
Yeah. 
even if we tried, we could not praise you enough. But with what we have, with the breath that you have given us, oh God, we pour it out right now. We pour it out like there's no tomorrow because we know tomorrow's not promised. So right now, right here, oh God, we pour out. We pour out our praise, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we love you. Yeah, yeah. Just remain standing where you are for a few more moments. Just a few more moments. In that place of worship. You came to connect to God today. Thank you, worship team and band, for playing. But you came to connect with God today because you've been absorbing all week. Like a sponge you've been absorbing. And when she talked about pouring out, this is where we empty out before God. Guess what? He can take it. Whatever it is you have to give, he can take it. So start seeing your mind. Just say, God, I thank you. Thank you. I thank you for my car, my tires, the air in my tires. I thank you for the engine that works and the check engine light that didn't come on, but maybe it did for somebody. I don't know. Come on. Shoot. Thank you for my seatbelt that works when I jam on my brakes. I thank you for gas in my tank. I thank you for the insurance that I have. I thank you for my family, my loved ones around me, my children. I thank you. I thank you. Our scripture for today as we remain standing comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verse 5. If you would be so kind to read this with me, please. And it says what? The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Father God, we come to you right now. We are so grateful for how you've kept us this week and this day, and we thank you for this day of worship. Now, as we take time to go into your word, reveal to us what you need us to know about you. Show us your love and your mercy and your grace one more time, Father, that we may fall in love with you all over again. Have your way in this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, family. Good to hear your voice this morning. Has anyone ever had laryngitis? When you can't talk and you're like, hi, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And you can't wait till you can get your voice back. So you got your voice this morning, amen? amen. Let me hear you say good morning. Good morning. Say thank you, God. thank you, God. I said, that's what I'm talking about. I want to have a, give a special thank you to our music department for great work last week on our reggae service. We really had some good fun. Amen? Yes. Amen. amen. All right, then we need to do it again to, uh, to the band. Jared, he was so weak. Minister Jared was so weak. If you understand, he, he had to sleep. And take a rest before the service so he can play. But he came through. He pushed through. And we are so grateful for him for doing that. To our musicians, Gene and, and, and Malik on keys. We thank him for our singers. We had Skylar, Kiona, Minister Belinda, and Minister Leah who were just singing and giving God worship. And we, we, we have to do that one more time, I think, you know. Just one more time. Just, just, just one more time. A few more times, you know. I mean, just a few more times, you know. Everybody was standing and singing and moving. I was like, that's what worship is. You can come in and give God your praise. Uh, also, I just wanted to bring to your attention, we have a church app, fam. We have a church app. And right now, we're actually, we're streaming into the church app. So for those who aren't able to make it today, they're actually able to go to the church app. They can go in. It says watch live, and they can watch the service live. Yeah? Try it right now. If you have it right now, try it right now. At the bottom, it says, walk, go live or watch live, something like that. If you haven't downloaded it yet, download and put in the church Transformation Worship in Rhode Island. All right. Some folks are testing. We've been getting messages back and forth. And you can actually chat while you're watching it live. Okay? Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool, pretty cool. So we're asking you to please uh, download the app because we're going to start streaming our services through there so you can see it. 
Also want to let you know, oh, are you hearing it? All right, we got proof. There's confirmation. <laughs> We've got confirmation. Amen, amen. Uh, coming up in October next month, we have a baptism scheduled. For those of you who may be interested or thinking about it, been wanting to give your life back to Christ, yes, let's talk about this. Let's have that conversation, please. Because, you know, there's no greater time than the time when you can give your life to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. There is a word from the Lord today. There is a word from the Lord. As we read our scripture this morning, there is a word. And I want to talk on the title this morning, When Unbelievers Believe. When Unbelievers Believe. It is not a secret to us that we live in a world of duality. We have light and darkness duality male and female husband and wife brother and sister sun and moon right and wrong up and what down, down. in and Out. we have political parties that are left wing and what right. come on y'all know my sermon already even in the bible it is loaded with words of duality like holy and what unholy righteous versus unrighteous good versus Bad. Heaven versus what? Hell. Hell. Jesus versus who? Satan. Satan. Lost versus what? Found. And a few weeks ago we talked about sheeps and what? No. Come on, somebody. Oof. But today, when unbelievers believe, because there is nothing more unsettling when there is disunity or division. We have all echoed the words United we stand and what? Divided we? You know that. Yet those are just clichéic words that sound good at the time. Because when we look around, our nation is divided on so many levels. We're divided on vaccination. We're divided on health care. We're divided on gender. We're divided on what is truth and what is fake news. We're divided on how to school our children. We're divided by politics. We're divided by capitalism. Everywhere we turn, we are being divided. We are so divided that we are becoming desensitized to what is actually real and what is not. Thus, it becomes, makes us become jaded, biased, discriminative, prejudiced, bigoted, selfish, and even narcissistic. But the Bible told us about that. Let's go to 2 Timothy, please. The Bible told us about that. It says what? Don't be naive. There are what? Difficult times when? Ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to be what? Self-absorbed, money-hungry, self-promoting, stuck-up, profane, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog-eat-dog, unbending, slanderers, impulsively wild, savage, and cynical mercy that's in the word the bible says in times to come right oh stay right there that's good i like that treacherous ruthless bloated windbags addicted to lust and allergic to who anybody have had allergies they'll make a show of religion but behind the scenes they're what stay clear of these people this is where we are now, y'all. Everyone is doing right in their own eyes, and everyone else might be possibly wrong. But our text today takes us to the, to the story of when Israel became a divided nation. The northern kingdom, which had ten tribes, and Judah, which occupied two. The kings of Israel are in disarray. They all have gone after other gods and have abandoned the one true God. And as it is, the people do what their kings do. They chase after other gods, which breaks the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So God allowed the Assyrian nation to oppress them, to rule over them. And nothing more the Jews hated is when people ruled over them. I mean, they came out of Egypt. Yet they continued to disobey God. 
So I found this story very fascinating because it is so filled with so much irony. It's going to cause us to take a look, a second look at God in a different perspective. To many of us, the story of Jonah is just another wonderful fictional story, maybe, of a, of, of a big fish that swallowed a man and kept him in the fish for three days. And then three days later, he spits him up on land. That sounds nice. But it's more than that. Because we enter the scene of the book of Jonah where God calls him to go and preach a message to the residents of Nineveh. Irony number one. Who's oppressing the Israelites? What's the name? Assyria, thank you. Assyria is oppressing them. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And the text tells us, Jonah's, God said to Jonah, arise, get up, which tells me a couple of things. Jonah was sitting down doing nothing. His people, the Israelites, were lost in disobedience to God and he was doing nothing. And God says, you know what? Since you ain't doing what you're supposed to do here, I'm going to send you on a mission. So God says, get up and go to Nineveh, and I want you to go and preach to them and tell them that I'm going to destroy their city within 40 days if they don't turn around. Jonah doesn't like that. He's discriminative. He's prejudiced. He hates the Assyrians. How could God ask me to go to the people who are oppressing me and preach to them? <laughs> Come on, God. Why would you ask me to go and preach to the people who look like they hate me? But God, even in this situation, God is showing his love for humanity. Regardless of wherever you are, whoever you are, God still loves you. And so he sends Jonah. Jonah's like, nah. Nah. God, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I thought about that. How many times have we told God, nah, I'm not doing it? How many times have we told him, not now? How many times have we told God, you just need to wait, chill for a minute, Jesus? How many times have we told God, I don't feel like it right now? How many times have we told God, ain't got time for that right now, Jesus? How many times have we flat out told God, no? And with our response, we went about our business as usual. Yet God is always seeking us, and there will come, become a time when he will stop seeking. For those of you who are listening right now to this, understand, if you've been telling God no, start considering changing your answer. Because I thought about this. How would you feel and how would I feel if we came to God and asked, Lord, can you please heal my body? And he says, nah, I don't feel like it. Lord, can you please protect my children today? Nah, I'm too busy for that. Lord, I need your help right now. Nah, can't do that. Can't do that. I got some other people who are actually interested in me and I'm going to give them my attention. If God answered us the way we answered him, we would be in great trouble. But so great is his mercy and his, so great is his faithfulness, it renews every morning like the sun. So I thank God so much that he doesn't treat us how we treat him. Which tells me he deserves more. Jonah runs from God. He gets on a ship. God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah's like, nah, not today, Jesus. And when you understand the text, it says he's going to Tarshish. Tarshish was about 3,000 miles south, which was actually like Spain back then. But when you read the text, last week we talked about something, right? It says Jonah went down. <laughs> he went down to the ship to go down to Tarshish. Whenever God calls us, we seem to have a habit of wanting to go down. He gets on the boat, and when he gets into the boat, the first thing he does, he goes down below. <laughs> Whenever we start running from God, we find ourselves always going down. So I want to show the map, please. Pull the map up, please. 
where you see that little thing over here, this is where he is, and he's got to go to Nineveh. Nineveh's about four to 600 miles approximation. And so he gets on the ship, and the God sends a storm to st- slow the ship from traveling down to Tarshish. The soldiers get afraid. They're throwing all their belongings over. Nothing seems to keep the ship. The storm is still coming. They're praying to their gods. The storm is still fierce. The winds are blowing. And they're like, everybody needs to pray to their gods. And they come to Jonah, and Jonah's like fast asleep in the midst of a storm. Man, he sounds like Samson. Remember we talked about Samson last week? Dude got his hair cut, and he was sleeping. And they wake him up and say, Jonah, come on, man. Don't you have a God you can pray to? We're about to die. And he comes up on the boat and he goes, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's my fault. It, it, it's, it's my fault. I'm going to say right now. So here's what we're going to do. Take me and throw me over into the ocean. Be like, no, nah, we can't do that. No. Who does that? And he's like, I'm telling you. Take me and throw me overboard. Finally, they realize there's nothing they could do about it. They take him and they throw him overboard. And the Bible tells us the moment they threw him overboard, the winds stopped. But God had prepared. This is interesting because we think that Jonah is being self-righteous here at this point of jumping overboard. He did not know God was going to send a fish. He was just so determined. He refused to go and preach. He'd rather die. You get that? He was willing to say, throw me overboard and let me drown and sink because I'm not going to preach. But God was like, yeah, I got you. Uh-uh. About to teach you a couple of lessons. So he sends a big fish. The fish swallows him up. And the Bible tells us, for three days, Jonah was in the belly of the fish. And he prayed. And he prayed. And the fish swims its way back up. Drops him off on land someplace, and he walks to Nineveh. He gets to Nineveh, and he, it, the Bible said it took about three to four days to walk through the whole city. So he starts walking in. Hey, people, just want to let you know, God going to kill y'all. I don't care, because he's going to kill you. Y'all deserve it, as a matter of fact, because all of y'all, you, 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 and you, God going to kill all of y'all and your children. And he's speaking this word and he's preaching it. And amazingly enough, the people are like, word? Hey, did you hear that? So picture this scenario because here's this Hebrew prophet coming into this town and he's giving this message to a people. And I had to think about what it felt like to being an Assyrian at that time. Here they are standing and they see this Hebrew prophet coming in talking about God's going to destroy their city. Assyria didn't worship God. They worshiped other gods. You follow me? They had other gods they worshiped. But something began to stir within them because they realized that if this Hebrew prophet who belongs in Israel is coming to tell us that God is going to do something, Israel's in a mess. (laughs) That's the irony again. And if God can take Israel, a big nation, and allow it to be divided and to be oppressed, man, if we don't obey God, what's going to happen to us? So the people begin to start listening, and they're like, "Uh uh-uh, well, you know, uh uh-uh. I think there may be some truth to this thing here. So they decide to go, and they start changing their clothing. And the word we use here was burlap, but in, 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 in the Bible it says sackcloth, it's you wear black when you're in grieving and you're mourning. It's, you cover your head and you sit on the ground in dirt or in ashes because you're like in a place of repentance. And so the people start going and taking off their clothes and changing. The king hears this. He does not consult his advisory team, Malik, and say, what do you think about this messenger? He immediately sends out a decree to everyone to repent and fast. <laughs> There's no board meeting, Congress meeting, White House meeting, staff meeting, nothing. He just sends out a decree. He says, everybody from who you are, the greatest person to the, the lowest person, I need for you to change your clothing, 
wear your morning clothing and start repenting. As a matter of fact, no eating and no drinking. Time to fast. We need to pray to God so that this, 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 this judgment that is coming can be averted. And the Bible tells us the king goes, he takes off his royal robes, puts on his burlap and his sackcloth, and he goes and he sits down and he sits in ashes praying to this God of Jonah. I can imagine Jonah's face. Okay, he's looking around and people are actually repenting. The people he hate, they are repenting towards God. And in his own indignation, he walks away from the city, sits there, and waits for God to destroy the city. (laughs) He was so blinded by his hate for other people, he couldn't see the love of God. He couldn't see it. And so, I had to look at this story and ask myself, how did these unbelievers believe? What happened? What, what triggered? What, what caused them to shift, pivot, change their posture? What was it? And I, I came across about three different reasons. Number one, unbelievers believe when they have to come to the conclusion that they are not God. <laughs> Our belief in God is many times measured by our need for God. I'm going to let that sink in a little bit. Our belief in God is many times measured by our need for God. Depending how much we need him determines how much we believe in him. That's why there can be times that we believe in God and other times we operate with just a belief about God. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. The difference between belief and believe. What's a belief? Anyone remember? It's a noun. Person, place, or thing. An idea, philosophy, moral values, principles. That's what a belief is. Source of information from the Bible. But believe... It's a what? It's a verb. That means believe demands action. Believe demands action. So if there are times when we believe in God and other times we just operate in the belief of God, what does that tell us? What does that tell us? It also tells us this. Listen, the problem comes when our belief in God is, almost, is also limited by our faith in God. It's a real simple message. But this is like a boost drink right now. It's like, like a, 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 a smoothie shake with a whole bunch of stuff in it. You know, kale and spinach and green stuff and green apples and... It ain't got no chicken, it ain't got no rice, it ain't got no beans, no kachupa, nothing in there, just straight. It's a power shake right here, real simple. When you move from unbelieving to believing in God, it means you've recognized that there is only one God. Number two, when unbelievers believe, they have accepted the reality that they need God. (laughs) They need God. What does that mean for us? Life happens, and when we are confronted with a daunting reality of pain and disappointment, we start asking the question, where is God? Somehow, pain gets our attention. That's when we stop thinking about praying, looking for the Bible, listening to some religious music. When pain and disappointment comes, And that's why I understand that God has to allow these things to come to us to get our attention so we can come back to him. The issue sometimes with pain is that when the pain has subsided, 
our need for God also subsides. Oof. All right, God, you know, Jesus, listen, this was good. Thank you for healing me. Good seeing you for the last two, three weeks. I got some stuff I need to take care of. I'm going to hit you up later, Jesus. Let me go about my business. The classic example of this is the children of Israel would get enslaved, would have people oppress them. They would cry out to God. God would come and he would deliver them. They would go good for a few years. And after that, they would go right back to the old habits again, all over again. And then God would put another oppressor over them. They would cry out to God and God would deliver them. And they would do good for a few more years. And it starts all over again. <laughs> But the third point of this, uh, uh, of this message is really simple. Unbelievers begin to believe when we realize we can't live without God. You get that? When we realize we cannot live without God. What does that mean? Because every day we are alive is because he protects us. We eat because he provides for us. We heal because he's the healer. He makes ways and opens doors that we didn't even ask. He walks with us and our children and our spouses and our family day after day. We don't even think about it and God still do what God does. And when our eyes can start seeing the God factor all around us, then our perspective will begin to change. Because many times life just revolves around us. Me, myself, and what? And my dog. But when your perspective begins to change, your life begins to revolve around God. That's the shift. That's what happens when unbelievers start believing. And, 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 and there's a unique thing about this because when we start believing, we have to keep believing. We can't start believing and stop. Go for a month. I done been to church. I done did four times. I'm good for the month. I'm good. Life is better now. My pain and my disappointment has dwindled down and subsided. I don't need God as much anymore. Let me figure out my life on my own now. No. When unbelievers start believing, you start believing and you keep on believing, which means you keep on living for God because believing demands what? Believing demands action. When, when unbelievers believe, it's saying this, I am believing into God. I'm going to shift that for a little bit there, right? We know the text can say, and the, and the text goes to Jonah 5, 3, 5. What does it say? The people of Nineveh believed God's message. Some of the translation says, and the people of Nineveh believed in God. But I want to push it a little further because the word in can also be interpreted as in to. So we can believe in God, I'm just using that as an illustration. I'm not asking for money, okay? I'm, I'm not asking for money. I'm being clear about this. We can believe that there may be something in this. We see it as a container. We can have a belief about that. We can actually believe and look in. But believing into God means putting my hand in. And I'm not putting my hand in just to take out mercy. You get that? I'm not putting my hand in just for a handout to take out. I'm putting my hand in because I'm giving him, I'm pouring out me into him. Okay? God is calling us to believe. And if we're going to believe, we have to believe into him. That means to say this, over and over, we have to keep believing the truths about God. That we are living in a relationship of commitment to God in trust and in union. Because when we say, I believe in God, I'm really professing my conviction that God has invited me to this commitment. 
and declaring that I have accepted his invitation. That's when we believe. It requires action. Believing into God. Because when you understand who God is, there is a lot about God we can't even fathom in our minds. He's great. I don't know how he spoke and birds came out the ocean. I, I don't get that. He spoke and breathed the breath of life and dirt became flesh, blood, and, and, and skin and bones. I can't fathom that. Science has not been able to replicate that. That's how God is. He is great beyond measure. And he is so patient with us. But also, my last point. What I'm also excited about, about this word believe and God is that God believes in us. Let me say that again. God believes in you. You know why he believes in you? Because his spirit dwells in you. What spirit, preacher? Okay, so the Bible declares that when God breathed into man the breath of life, the breath of life, the breath, the breath is the ruach, the, 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 the breath, the spirit of God enters man. It's the spirit of God we are able to be alive. But as we give access to the spirit of God, it empowers us to live our lives even on a greater platform. So God has some stuff in us that he knows. That's how we can grow our faith because he already has his spirit in us. That's how much he believes into us. Mercy. Because his spirit dwells in us. And every morning the sun rises. Whether we like it or not, every morning it rises from the east and sets in the west because God's promise is, listen, I'm going to give you another day. One more day. Let's see what you can do today. And the day passes and we didn't talk about God, we didn't think about God. He's like, I'm going to give you tomorrow. We look around and people are falling asleep in death. And we're free, fearful. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they just died that way. Oh my goodness. Oh my, oh my. Listen. <laughs> when their time comes to an end and he puts them to sleep, their assignment is done. The reality of the issue is this. We're still alive. If we're looking at them sleeping and we do nothing about it, shame on us. We sing a song here, God's not done with you yet. Not yet. So every morning you have breath. You wake up and you say, thank you, God. Every morning you go through, you see how you can be a blessing to someone. You can help someone. Every morning you go through life, you, you thank him, you, you give it to somebody else. Every morning, every day. Because every day God is giving into us. Every day. Every day. There's a thing about ropes. I was taking a look at this. And as I process this thing about ropes... I began to think about our rope as some sort of measure of faith. You got that picture for me? So I looked at this. This is a really nice picture. Thank you, by the way. Really nice. Good detail on the picture, too. High quality. Some of us may start from here with a two-millimeter cord because that's how thin our faith is. And it goes up. But it only gets stronger if we keep believing. You follow me? It only grows and gets stronger if we keep believing. Because there comes a time, go to the next pick, please. There comes a time when all we're going to have is that to hold on to. Nobody around us, no Facebook likes, no social media, no, no friends, no family, nada, no workers, no co-workers, no colleagues, nothing. We're going to find ourselves hanging on by this rope. And all we can think about, the sun is still coming up. My Lord. Guess what? God is faithful. 
and he sees us there. And he knows we're there. And he knows how much we can hold on. And he knows how long we can last. And he's like, stay right there for a minute. Our faith, when we keep believing in God, this is where our faith gets us to. That when we find ourselves in the chasm of life between two, two, uh, two rocks and, and below us, it's, it seems darkness and depression and anger and frustration. That's where our faith holds us up. Our faith holds us up. And we can't develop faith if we stop believing. Everybody get that? You can't grow your faith if you stop believing. So the choice is yours. The decision is yours. You've got to decide. God, I'm not right. And God knows that. God, I got issues. He knows that. We all do. Trust me. Our faces may be different in height and complexion, but we all got issues. We all got issues. I'm going to speak real bad English right here. We all got issues. And God doesn't care because he still loves us. And that's what's powerful about that. That despite our issues, he still sends the sun up every morning. But the decision is yours. You've, you, you've got to think about it. Because in life, seasons come, right? We live in New England. We know that different seasons come. But in life, seasons come. We have good days, and then we have not-so-good days. And we need God. Come on. Any, anybody can testify that we need God? Yes. Nobody gets car insurance only for when you drive it and when you park it, you turn it back off. No one does that. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Now that I'm home, I'm going to go back to my app and shut off my service. I don't need insurance for the rest of the night until tomorrow or the next time I drive again. No one does that. You stay under what? Coverage. That no, my, no matter what happens through the night, you still got coverage. Are you covered by Jesus? Are you covered by Jesus? Please stand to your feet. Lord, we stand before you right now. Not because not because we are worthy. Not because we got it together. Not because we are perfect, but because we messed up. We messed up all week. We've been messing up, Jesus. We are addicted to you, correction, addicted to sin and allergic to you. Please give us a dosage of your Benadryl of faith that can suppress all those allergic reactions and allow us to breathe in your breath and pour out your praise. We open up our hearts to you right now. Wherever you are, just open up your hands. Just open up your hands. Just, just as an act of surrender. Talk to God for yourself because this is, this is what it's about. He loves you and he loves me. And he wants to save us because he wants us to live with him forever. Purpose in your heart that you'll give him more access to your life. Purpose in your heart that you'll give him a few more inches of your life. Purpose in your heart that you won't stop believing in him. Purpose in your heart that you will keep exercising your faith and your trust in him. Purpose in your heart 
that when you fall down and you ask for forgiveness, he will forgive you. Purpose in your heart to stand on his word no matter what. I don't understand how Noah built the ark and he was a drunk and God never canceled him. He was so drunk one day, he was naked and his sons had to cover him. But God still loved him. And God still honored him for his faith despite his issues. We have to think that we have to be perfect for a church. No. It's God who restores us. It's God who cleans us up. It's God who, 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 who reconciles us back to himself. It's God. So purpose in your heart to give him your life. Even when you're tempted to do wrong. Purpose in your heart. Father, we stand here. As we look in the mirror, we see all the dark spots of our lives. The lies we've told ourselves, the lies we have believed. But we want to exchange our lives for your truth. Because your truth sets us free. Your truth empowers us. Your truth brings healing to our lives. And your truth gives us peace. So Father, we surrender it all to you. Everything we have, we give to you withholding nothing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus this morning. Amen, amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that powerful word. Um, I was reminded of a popular hymn that we would sing often, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy. a faithful God we serve. I pray that God will continue to strengthen each and every one of our, our faith so that we can move into action and not just belief, not just the now, move into action, walk in our faith. I'm at this time, we're going to continue our worship with giving back to God what he has given to us, giving him his tithes and our offering. Um, very convenient what we have now is we still have the cash app and you can still text to give but now you can also go into the app <clears throat> you can give right on the app um, you're welcome and do all of your giving from there very convenient um, also another way to encourage you to download the app and use it so you can remain connected and know what's going on within our our church um, so at this time if you have cash and you'd like to bring it up you may do so if you'd like to go into the app right now or cash app whatever is convenient for you to give All right. um, if you can just stand with us as we pray and bless this, these tithes and offering Father God a 
loving Savior, faithful God. Lord, we thank you that we were able to feel your presence today in this worship experience. We thank you for your many blessings, oh God. Thank you for blessing us with things that we don't even acknowledge many times. Lord, I pray that you may continue to strengthen our faith day to day, Lord God, and that we may be true believers walking in our faith, taking action in our belief. Father God, help our unbelief also. Forgive us for those times where we we wanted to lean on our own understanding, oh God. But I pray that we may continue to put our trust in you, surrender to you, surrender withholding nothing. God, I pray now that you may be with us as we leave this place, but never your presence. I pray for traveling mercies. I pray for your covering and your favor upon each and every one of your children under the sound of my voice, oh God. Lord, we love you. We honor you. And we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God be with you. Protect you always. And have a great week.